Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Susan Heilman, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. NanoDays is here once again, and now I have with me one of our speakers, Dr. Jessica Winter, chemical engineer at The Ohio State University. She's going to talk about her as a chemical engineer, the type of research she did, and then kind of a life-changing experience that changed not necessarily the way she did research, but the way she thought about her research. Hello, Dr. Winter. Thanks for joining me. Hi. Thanks for having me. Let's first just get into your basic research, what you did before, and then we can talk about how you changed from the standard academic um, you know, publish or perish idea and how your perspective kind of changed on that. So what is your area of research? So the majority of my research is in the area of nanoparticles for imaging. And I work with a particular type of nanoparticle known as a quantum dot. And it's made from semiconductor materials like the things used in your laptop. And I've been working on them since 1999 when I started my thesis project in this area. And at that time, they were just emerging as a material. And most people were interested in them for applications in solar cells. And my research was some of the first projects that were done in the area of biology and trying to use these for imaging. They're very useful for imaging because they fluoresce or light up. So the idea was maybe we could use them to tag different parts of a cell. So really, really small things that we can't easily see normally. Right. So uh, a bare quantum dot, meaning it has no coating or anything else on it, is in the size range of about five nanometers, which is about twice the width of DNA. So the thought was that we could look at these very small molecules inside a cell, maybe even tracking them to understand how the cell uses them. So what did you move into next? Right. So when I started at The Ohio State University, they really encouraged me to shift my research to cancer because this is a a bigger problem that impacts many more people. And it's a main focus at our university. Was it like, were they talking brain cancer? or they Brain cancer. And actually, most of my research is in the area of brain cancer now. But we had some success in, in labeling, especially in being able to do multiple colors of labeling at the same time, which was a clinical need. And so around this time... Uh, I was approached by the physicians over in breast cancer and asked if I could apply similar technology to breast. And I, of course, said, sure, and I'm more than happy to to try um, a different problem. Breast sounded great. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So in breast cancer, um, that's one of those cancers that there's lots of different mutations or lots of different things that can make the breast cancer different from person to person. It affects the treatment. So how do your dots help with this. Yeah, so breast cancer is actually a really good model for what's called personalized medicine, which is this concept that each cancer is unique because it expresses different proteins and that those proteins can be targeted by different drugs. So if you have the protein, the drug will probably work, and if you don't, it won't. But we need to know which proteins you have to match you to the appropriate drug combination. And in breast cancer, the standard clinical practice is the test for three receptors. So this was a good place for us to start looking at the potential for these quantum dots that light up and have these different colors. Can we look at these three different receptors in this model? All at the same time. All at the same time. Okay, so now enter your own personal story to this. Not that the rest of this isn't a personal story, but all of a sudden it becomes more realistic for you. Yeah, so... um About three months after I started working on this breast cancer project, and I had gotten to know all the physicians over there pretty well, um, I found a lump when I was doing a self-exam. And I went to my gynecologist, and they said, you know, we're not sure. We'll send you for a mammogram. And it turned out that I indeed had breast cancer, and I was only 35 years old. So I'm not old enough to get mammograms at that point. You know, I wouldn't have found it if it weren't for the self-exam. So you were lucky that you did find it. I was very lucky. And, of course, I I talked to my physicians um, that I had been collaborating with. And they kind of walked me through the process. And I was very fortunate um, to have 
in a sense, the understanding that a physician would have about the disease, but it's also a disadvantage because I'm actually perfectly capable of reading my own pathology report. Right. And knowing too much almost. But on the other hand, it completely changed how I look at research. And I I love having the perspective of both sides. And I don't want to give people cancer, but I kind of wish that more physicians and researchers had a patient perspective as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Let's before we talk about what that perspective did, we can just we'll cut to the chase and say, so you're cancer free now. It's been five years um, since my last treatment, and uh, everything seems okay right now. Great. So we'll leave it there. Okay. Nope. That's <laughs> fine. So I just wanted to say good news with that. Yes. Let's talk about the patient perspective that you talked about because it has to do with you love solving all these different problems. You get lots of different problems. Like let's try it in brain. Let's try it in breast. Um, and then oftentimes it's let's move on to the next problem. Right. So the academic research paradigm is I'm going to come up with an idea, test my idea, and publish a paper. Um, and then that's the end of it. And once I became a patient, I realized that I had research in my own laboratory that could potentially help patients like me, and I wasn't doing anything to help get it to patients. I was just publishing papers and making pretty pictures, and uh, that was the end of it. And I really changed my focus, and I thought hard about how I have such a unique opportunity to fight cancer as both a patient and a researcher with the potential to make more global impact so that other people go through less than I went through. I mean, it's not like you held back and said, no, I'm not going to give this to the cancer community. But, you know, did you feel that you could, how fast you could get it there or what the next step was going to be? Yeah, most researchers, the difference between doing research in a laboratory and doing research on patients is a wide gulf. So Mm -hmm. most researchers who are not MDs don't try to take their research beyond what's called the bench, meaning the lab. And maybe if an interested clinician happens upon your doorstep who wants to try it, then you would pursue that. But I decided that we wanted to focus on something called translational research. And that's actually really hard because even if you do find an interested doctor, a lot of times they come to you and they expect it to work the first time. Right. That you're already at the treatment Right. And we're not. Like, we haven't ever tried it in a person. I don't know if it'll work or not. And it will probably require iteration in the same way that the first time you got on a bike did that work out well for you? I mean, no, it takes some practice. So you have to find a really good partner on the clinical side who understands it's probably not going to work on round one, but we'll keep working at it until we get something that's effective. So did you have that partner right away? I did. I was fortunate that um, we have a very uh, collaborative environment where I am at the Ohio State University. Um, The James Cancer Center is a comprehensive cancer center, which means it has funding from the National Institutes of Health specifically for research. And so that's a big focus there. Mm -hmm. And um, once it became clear that I had useful materials, I actually had quite a few physicians coming to me. Oh, great. Which was great. Yeah. And a lot of them are also MDPH so they understand the research side both as well as the clinical treatment. Sure, yeah. sure. Although you still had that patient perspective, which I think was one more added bonus. Right. To that. Yeah. Most of them didn't didn't have that. So you've got the clinical collaborator now for this. For yeah, the, I have several. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I just, okay. So you have several. So how easy was it then to go from here's my research let's do this let's make a treatment or a diagnostic let's get well, this to the patient the very first roadblock that we came up against is we initially thought we might do a test using a mouse model and we calculated that we needed um i think it was 10 milligrams of material and we each individual batch that we made was uh, one one hundredth of that. So we have to do a hundred batches to get enough material for one mouse test. For one mouse, and and never mind the fact that that's only one mouse. How would I ever get that to a patient right. quantity? I, it just doesn't seem practical at all. And we tried the obvious thing of just making what we were doing larger, like sure. make a, get a bigger beaker and put more stuff in it. But like that, nano things never work the way you think they're going yeah, to work. Yeah, that didn't work. <laughs> so we were actually at a roadblock. And um, one of my lab managers <laughs> wanted to hire a person to just make the 100 batches Ow. and combine them all together. Yeah. But I felt like there had to be a better way to do that. 
And that's when I remembered that one of the co- my colleagues in the department had she hadn't done exactly the same thing, but she had made um, something called a liposome, which is often used to deliver gene therapy agents okay. using a spray based approach that was continuous. Continuous just means Henry Ford assembly line. Right. And so I'm thinking if I can do it continuously, maybe I can make a lot of it. Um, so I, I contacted uh, my colleague, Dr. Barbara Wuzlusel, and asked her if she could help me. So she's an expert in electrospray, which is basically a process that creates a fine jet of particles, droplets, droplet particles. But are you still making 10 milligrams, 100 no. milligrams? In our very first attempt, we scaled up 30-fold. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so that it's... was without any optimization. Right. Okay. So we're now um, making much, much higher quantities. Okay, so now you're scaling it up and you're right. getting more of it. Are you ready to put it into mouse models at that point? Well, we we have to characterize what we're making and make sure it matches what we made in batch. And so we did that. And one really great thing about electrospray is it's pretty robust. So under most operating conditions, we do get the same thing. But occasionally we got something odd. Mm-hmm. We're interested in making particles, which you can envision as a little sphere. But sometimes we didn't make spheres. We made cylinders. So uh, we wanted to understand what was happening because if we did want to use this with patients and we'd have to go through FDA, one of the most important components is that you make the same thing every time. So you (laughs) at least know what it is you're putting in. We really need to be able to do that. So they're beautiful, wonderful shapes uh, that we can make. Some of them look like trees branching off, but not especially helpful from a clinical perspective. Okay. And always with that (laughs) clinical perspective. So that's good to have that. I mean, you could right. publish the paper and be done. But right, and, and we will have a lovely paper coming out on interesting shapes that has no clinical relevance okay. whatsoever. Excellent. So there's always that. So how do you figure out what these shapes are or why you were making them? We had just hired a new person in the department, Dr. Lisa Hall, who was a computationalist who studied polymers, which are um, a, the main component of the quantum dot box. So I approached her and asked if she could help. So she figured out why you were making these other she shapes did. or how to prevent making these other um, shapes? Yeah. So she helped us understand what kinds of conditions cause the weird shapes to form. And, you know, part of it is if the particle forms really slowly, there's a lot of time for the polymer to move around and it likes to make that cylindrical shape. Mm, So if we make it faster, we can get more spheres. But if we're too fast, a really good sphere doesn't form and you get a lumpy particle. You don't want that either. So there's a sweet spot in the middle. Okay, so now are you ready for (laughs) clinical trials? So what Um, happens next? So at this point, we did do some pilot trials, which means initially just one patient, and then we did up to five patients. And this isn't in the patient itself? No, this so this is all for a biopsy-type test. Okay. So it's what's called an in vitro diagnostic, which means it's a test that's on outside the body, on tissue or blood. We've done both. That worked. But we're still not ready for a true clinical trial because in order to do a clinical trial, you need to have a manufacturing facility that makes the product according to what's called good manufacturing practice, which basically means the Fed, the Food and Drug Administration does not want me putting random stuff in your body. So we've been spending um, about the last year creating a process and mostly creating quality control around the process mm-hmm. to ensure that every time we make this, we get the same thing. So we think we'll be ready to do a true clinical trial this summer. Oh, that's, that's our goal. actually pretty soon. Yeah. That's, so that's not the standard up. five to ten years no, that well, you we've, often hear. We've so. been working on this for you're about right. four years. Okay. So, so that would be consistent. You're in the five to ten yes, year time. Yes, yes, so we're getting right there. there. Um, so it will depend. We have to get approval from the FDA. Mm-hmm. So it will depend on how long it takes to process all of that. But we can see the end of the tunnel. We're nearing the goal. We do know that it does work. It's really just a matter at this point of testing it against the current technology. So the problem, the current technology, 
technology only tests one marker mm-hmm. and we want to test multiple. So we'll have to show that for the one marker, it detects as well as that. Okay. And then it the current technology doesn't do multiple markers. So there's no way to compare that. We just have to demonstrate that it can functionally do that. So once you can, you know, optimistically speaking here, you're going to show that it can identify multiple markers. And so how is that specifically, you mentioned much earlier, personalized medicine. So how is that going to affect an individual patient? Right. So the idea here is to create a test. It would be used after you've already been diagnosed with cancer to try to determine what type of cancer you have, specifically which proteins are being expressed so that I can then determine what drug treatment you should get. So it would probably be used first initially to make that part of the diagnosis. And then based on that, they'd start you on a drug treatment regimen, which may include broad spectrum chemo, but might just be a molecular therapy like tamoxifen or Herceptin. Like one specific molecule that targets one specific protein that they know you have. Right. And then this test would also be used prognostically. So after you've been on the therapy for a certain amount of time and you come for your next appointment, they could repeat the test and see if the drug is working. And it depends on the formulation. Um, Right now we're focusing on blood-based tests. Oh good, So that it could be done. It's not entirely non-invasive, but a blood draw is pretty routine for these types of patients. So it's something where it could be monitored throughout treatment without, yes, without having to repeat a biopsy. So it seems like you're especially with this this summer coming up or about to start clinical trials, how does this make you feel that you've your patient perspective has potentially paid off or is, or may pay off soon? Uh, honestly, I'm I'm still kind of nervous. You know, yeah. I I want to I really want it to be successful from the academic point of view or from your patient point of view. From the patient point of view, and uh, the everything has gone well to this point, but you never know what will happen when you finally get into the actual patient model and you're doing it at large scale, so more than a couple patients. Um, I'm excited about the potential to make an impact in the field. And I also know that this is only one of many technologies Mm -hmm. in my lab. So even if I'm not entirely successful here, I have a lot of other opportunities. And everything that I've learned from this process will make me that much more likely to be successful in the future as well. So you don't feel like you'll ever really go back to that academic cycle, but you like staying in the the clinical cycle where you can try and take it to the next step. I think um, being in the translational niche is a good place for us because there aren't very many groups trying to do that work. Mm -hmm. And I, frankly, am an engineer. And engineers and scientists are not the same. Right. We always try to lump together, but scientists ask fundamental questions. Mm -hmm. Why do things in the world do that? An engineer says, oh, it does that. I'm going to make something cool with it. Right. And so engineers are inherently the people who focus on translation of science. We've always done that. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I'm fulfilling my role as an engineer and trying to work in this area. I'm very excited about that. And and yeah, the, the idea that I could potentially help other people so that they don't go through what I went through. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today and for describing this journey that you've been on. Thanks. I've I've really enjoyed our conversation. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.